Warning, this game contains scenes of explicit violence and gore. Hey everybody, and welcome back to Ready Steady Play. I'm here for a very exciting video. I'm going to show you how to play Resident Evil 2, the board game. Resident Evil 2, as you may know, is a video game from some time ago. There's also a recent HD remake of the game. But this is the board game version, produced by Steamforge Games, famously known for making Dark Souls the board game and other stuff like Guild Ball. This is uh, obviously on license from Capcom, so it's got the official everything going on about it, and it was a big Kickstarter, and if you pledged all into the Kickstarter, you can do the entirety of the Resident Evil 2 board video game. And if you remember that content, there is a lot going on in the Resident Evil 2 video game. It was enormous. But we've, we're just going to look at the core set in this video because to tackle all of the boxes that came in that Kickstarter would take me the rest of the year. Fortunately, having been through some of the other boxes, I don't think that there will be a lot to learn if you understand how the contents of this box works. So once we've tackled this one, you should be well on your way to making your way through the various campaigns and stuff that are on offer in the Resident Evil 2 board game. If you've heard nothing about this, or you've got your giant pledge at home that you got because you love Resident Evil 2, and you've not really got any idea what it's all about, never fear. Resident Evil 2 is a cooperative, a fully cooperative game for one to four players. So there is a solo mode, but I think it's ideally played with a friend or two. There is lots of other game modes available in the other Kickstarter content, including PvP mode and various other game modes. We're just going to talk about the co-op mode that comes in this box. What's presented here is eight scenarios which you'll play through that form the plot of the Resident Evil 2 story. There are many more stories. If you're familiar with the game, you'll know that there are two complete campaigns in the game. This is primarily exploring Leon's campaign, and if you want to go and find out more about Claire's campaign, you're going to have to look at the other boxes in the Kickstarter. And if you don't have them, well, at least you can get into Leon's campaign, which was, I think, considered to be the main story of Resident Evil 2. You can play either a standalone scenario, picking a level out of the eight scenario arc and playing it as a cooperative venture with your friends, or you can play through all eight in order as they escalate in difficulty, tracking your progress in a cam light campaign mode. I call it light because there, it, if you are used to full-on campaigns like Kingdom Death Monster or Gloomhaven, this will seem very light in comparison. But without further ado, let's have a look at what's in the box. So we'll do a bit of a component breakdown first. And once I've gone through the components, I'll show you how to set up the game, and then I'll talk about the gameplay itself as well. Here in the box, you've got one rule book, which you will need because the first scenario is in this rule book. There's also a rundown of all the rules that I'm going through in this video now. After you've beaten scenario one, you'll need this scenario book to continue with the story of the game. Whoa, there's a big old tray of minis. So you've got some zombie dogs, we've got uh, the player characters in grey, we've got a row of zombies here, we've got um, up here we've got the liquors, you'll remember these from the game if you've played it, and if not these are tougher enemies than zombies. We've also got up here Mutant G, and up here we've got William Birkin, Stage 3. Now you've got three zombie sculpts in here, but uh, if you back the Kickstarter, you will have a lot more zombies coming through as a stretch goal. There are two types of zombie presented in the game, but these zombie models are pretty much all interchangeable, just giving you variety of the zombies that you'll encounter as you make your way through the levels. And then the four player characters you've got here are everybody's favorite uh, Kendo gun shop owner man who dies immediately in the game and video game and I have no idea why he's in here. Then you've got Leon S. Kennedy, who is the main character of the video game series. Claire Redfield, who's also a main character from the video game series and is cool. And Ada Wong, who is a, I guess, a tertiary character in the video game series. She's a double agent and she's sneaky and she's up to no good. Watch out for her. 
We're gonna have custom game dice. Two good damage dice, three standard combat dice. You'll need these for resolving pretty much every conflict in the game. And an encounter die, which has an umbrella symbol on it. You've got a deck of tension cards. Some of these are good, some of these are bad. They escalate in quality from green safety, amber danger, and red, uh-oh, oh no. Here we've got character cards as well. One for each character. Monster cards here, these one for each kind of monster you're gonna fight in the game. A deck of subject cards for each boss as well. You've got a whole bunch of these mini style cards here as well. And the main difference between these are that some of them depict S, which stands for starting item. Some of them will depict an A, which stands for deck A, and some B, which stands for item deck B. We've got these player boards. These are used for tracking your hit points. There's four because the game goes up to four players. And you can see you can conveniently put your little manny on here. And now you've got a player board. We've got dials. Oh, yes, we do. These are ammo trackers. There's one for each gun in the game, and these are going to be used to track your ammunition as you go through the game. As you know, in Resident Evil games, ammo is scarce and hard to come by, so these are really important to help you make sure that you have enough ammo to kill those zombies. we got tiles. Lots of tiles. This isn't even all the tiles, but you're going to punch out a bunch of tiles that look like this. These are going to be used to build up your maps as you go through the game and can be used to make varying different kinds of maps. We've got all kinds of rooms. We've got lots of L-shaped corridors, lots and lots of different types of maps. Here we've got doors, yes, lots of doors. They're really important, actually, these doors uh, in the way the game works. And they've got uh, an open and a shut side. I also have in here an item box. We also have two matching sets of staircases. We're going to need to know where to look for items on the board, and these are going to tell us where. These are items from item deck A, and these are items from item deck B. These will be put out on the map at the beginning, and they'll show you where your items are. Here we've got some little hearts. They've also got poison on the other side. These little hearts indicate you're are used to track your health on your health board. Remember the health board? Here it is. These are going to track your health. Also, they're going to indicate when you become poisoned. Some enemies have more than one hit point, and these tokens are going to show you when you've wounded them. At least on the red side they do, so these are going to be used to track enemy wounds. The other side has a gross bug on it, and this is for when the G-Mutant spits imagos at you. So what does that mean? Well, there's an enemy that barfs bugs on you, and these track who's got bugs on them. Here we've got ink ribbons. Ink ribbons are really, really important. In the video game, they let you save your game. In this game, they let you buy more time before the mission ends. This ink ribbon has a backpack on the back. If you're lucky enough to find it, you can increase your inventory size. Status tokens. These status tokens are going to track uh, what's going on, like sometimes bad stuff happens. Like Rising Fear and Echoes in the Darkness, and you put these out on the board to remind you that you have to resolve more bad stuff that's happened to you. This little stack here is corpses and typewriters. Here's a corpse. Watch out for corpses. Sometimes they wake up and they're not corpses after all. Here's a typewriter. You can use an ink ribbon here to reset your tension deck and re buy yourself more time. This thing here is a health tracker for bosses. If a boss shows up in the game, you'll set their hit points on this, and then you'll track it as it counts down and you do damage to it. You should also have a bunch of these locked cards here that are double-sided and show you whether or not doors in the game are locked. You should also have a bag of walls. Two long walls and four short walls. Now, be careful not to throw these away. I can appreciate that they might not look like components, but they totally are. So in order to start playing Resident Evil 2, the first thing you need to do is decide how you're going to play. So the two primary ways of playing are scenario mode, where you pick one of the eight scenarios and you just play it, and campaign mode, where you play through them in order, and you have to get to the end without failing too many times, and you track some of your items and equipment between scenarios to increase the challenge and make you sort of feel the pressure of the survival horror elements of the game a bit more keenly. Once you're set up to start playing a scenario, you don't really need to worry anymore about whether you're doing the campaign mode or the scenario mode, because the actual gameplay itself is identical. So now I'm going to show you the setup, and I'll just talk through the minor differences between the setup for a scenario-based adventure and a campaign-based adventure, because they're very minor. The game offers, out of the core set, three different game modes. Easy mode, which can apply to both scenario mode and campaign mode, and just makes life easier. Then there is solo mode, which is where you're playing by yourself, and sometimes you'll control just one character, and sometimes you'll control more than one character. And solo mode, again, is a bit like easy mode in that you'll just apply it to the standard game. The game will start you off in scenario 1A to introduce you to the rules and give you the very basics. 
In scenario 2a, it will give you some additional rules, and in scenario 3a, it will give you the remaining advanced rules, so by the end of 3a, you're ready to play the full game as you continue through the campaign. If you pick any of the scenarios from 3a onwards, you'll be playing the full game. I'm going to show you all of the rules in this video, but I'm just going to set up scenario 1a because it doesn't actually really matter which scenario we set up for illustrative purposes. But note that you wouldn't use some of the more advanced rules in this scenario if you were playing through the campaign in full. So without further ado, let's look at the key sections of the setup of the game. So the very first thing you're going to do is pick a character. I'm going to set up a game for two players, so I'll pick two characters, and I'm just going to take Leon and Claire. And every player will get one of these player boards. They'll take their game piece, they'll take their character card here, and they'll put it on their game board like that. We're each going to need a little heart token that we can set to fine here, which is our top hit points. And we are ready to pick our scenario. So as I said, we're going to set up scenario 1A from the book. So I'll just put those pieces out now, and then I'll show you what I've done. So here we have the board set up for scenario 1A. We've laid out our tiles in a specific configuration with doors and walls, with zombies and items all in specific locations. Characters have two starting points. The characters must all be, always be split as evenly as possible, but if you're playing solo, you'll always start in spawn point one, unless you're playing with more than one character, which you may have to do. Now here you can see the scenario brief for this scenario. This is the board as we've laid it out. You can see all the key here, but we can ignore that for now. As you can see, all the rooms are green, and we'll talk more about that later. What's important really here is that item deck A, B, and the tension deck are all specified along the bottom. Every time you set up a scenario, you'll have to set up item deck A and B, as well as the tension deck. You'll have to go through all the cards and make sure you put these decks together. So even though you know what's in the deck, you may not necessarily know where each given item is. So here I've got my tension deck with all the green cards, the amber, and the red card. There's a little key along the bottom as well, which will tell you which scenarios this is used in. So I'm just going to give item deck A a shuffle here and put it next to item deck B, which does only have one card in it. Each character begins the game with a handgun, a knife, and a first aid spray. At the beginning of the game, you always have these three items, no matter whether you're playing a scenario or the campaign. However, later on, if you're playing in scenario mode, you'll change up your starting items, but if you're playing in campaign mode, you'll continue with the items that you've gained so far. Whenever you take a gun, you'll need the ammo dial that goes with it. When you gain a new gun, you always set the ammo dial to maximum ammo. So you can just put your items here below your character board. You'll probably also want to get out any enemy cards that relate to the enemies in the scenario. As you progress through the game, you'll put out more of these, but for now, we probably just need the zombie for scenario 1A. So with that, we're pretty much set up to play the game. Now, no matter which scenario you're playing, these rules should do you well. There is one little advanced rule that I'm going to show you now, just in case you're playing one later and you forget it because it's easy to forget. When you're setting up more advanced scenarios, like scenario 3A here, heading back to Marvin, you might notice some items marked with a little star here. This star indicates that these are key to the mission, and they're designed to be a bit harder to find. So once you've built item deck three, total the number of the cards in the deck, in this case it's nine, and then half it, rounding up, so we'll take five cards, and we'll shuffle the two red jewels into those five cards so that they're in the second half of the deck. Then we'll put the other four on top in order to make the entire item deck. So now that we've gone through setup, we're going to go into gameplay, and I'm going to talk you through just how to play a game of Resident Evil 2. Resident Evil 2 is actually fairly straightforward to play, and there are some very basic concepts to understand, but once you get the hang of a round, you'll be able to take turns and punch through the game pretty quickly, giving it this fast, frantic pace, and you have to sort of keep an eye on things, lest they get out of hand quickly. Players will take turns, and in a player turn, there are three phases. 
We start with an action phase, in which case the player will take actions with their figure. Phase two is the reaction phase, in which enemies who are near the player will react to what the player's done. And finally, the tension phase, where the player will draw a card from this deck and carry out the instructions. There are six actions a player can take. Move, attack, open or close door, trade, search, and use item. Of these six actions in the action phase, a player can take four actions total. They could move four times, they could attack four times, they could move once, search, use an item, and then trade. It's really up to you which actions you want to take, but there's no limitations on the configuration of the actions. So we'll take a look at these actions now so you understand what you're going to be doing. The first action is the move action, which is fairly simple. The first action we're going to look at is movement and how to move around the board. So let's have a quick look at the board and the anatomy of the tiles, and then we'll have a look at how we move around it. Now players and monsters follow the exact same rules for movement. In order to make a move action, a player will move one space. So I'll put Claire here in this room, and when she moves, she can move one square. She can make up to four movements, so she could move four squares in a single turn, it's also worth noting that she can move orthogonally and diagonally. However, she can only move diagonally if she has the free space in which to do so. What this means is that you cannot move diagonally through doors or diagonally around corners. So you can only move diagonally if there's free spaces on either side. Monsters follow the same rules of orthogonal and diagonal movement. You are free to move through a space containing an enemy provided there is space in that space to do so. The bases we see here on these two models are standard size bases. You can fit four standard size bases into a single space without causing any issue. However, once you attempt to fit a fifth base in there, there's no room, so you can only have a maximum of four bases in a single space. Some monsters have bigger bases, like this Lictor. These are called large bases, and they count as two standard bases. So you can have a liquor in a space with a zombie dog and Claire, but no one else can go into this space. Bosses have huge bases, and some are even bigger than this, but we'll look at the two bosses that come in the core set later on. There is another danger to moving through a space with an enemy. If you're ever in a space with an enemy and you take an action that's not attack that enemy, then the enemy will get a basic attack against you. We'll explain how basic attacks work, but if you ever want to move out of a space that contains an enemy, because either the enemy moved into your space and you want to run away, or because you're trying to move through a space that contains an enemy, you must make a basic attack check. And if the check fails and you're hit by the attack, then you must cancel the move as well. This goes for all actions in a space with an enemy that aren't attack, but more is most notable with movement because it will cancel your movement out of the space and you'll be forced to check again or attack the enemy. So now that we've looked at that, let's have a look at attacking. And in order to understand attacking, we're going to look in a bit more detail at our character cards and our item cards as well. So you can see here on Claire's card, she has a handful of statistics. Now, the, up here, this is her inventory. This is the number of items she can carry. Over here, she's got her evasion. This is going to be used for basic ch attack checks when an enemy attacks her. So we need to keep our eye on this. And down here we've got a special ability she can use, and down here we've got all the weapons that she can equip. She begins the game with two weapons, a handgun and a knife. This symbol up here indicates the amount of ammunition the mac that is the maximum for the weapon. So a knife has infinite ammo, and a handgun has 15 bullets. Then down here we've got four symbols. This is the range of the weapon. Here we've got the number of dice rolled per attack with the weapon. And then here we've got the outcome of a hit symbol, and the outcome of a double hit symbol. Here we've got an attack die. The attack die is divided 50-50 into two kinds of symbols. We've got two regular attack hits here, we've got one double hit, and then we've got three dodge symbols. We'll look at the dodge symbols in a minute when we look at enemies' basic attacks, but when you're attacking with your weapon, you're looking for these hits. Now it's worth noting that the hits equate immediately to the result below, so two Single hits does not count as a double hit. For example, if you were to roll this result, you would apply this effect twice. You would not apply this effect. There are some symbols down here that give the weapon special effects. These are listed on the back of the rulebook, so I can let you look most of them up by yourself, 
But this one here is, means that it's a universal weapon, so anyone can equip the knife, even though it's not depicted on their character card. This one here is rapid fire, which means that when you take an attack with the pistol, you would normally roll one die and reduce your ammunition by one, but with rapid fire, you can reduce your ammunition by up to three, and for each bullet that you spend, you get to roll one additional die, allowing you to roll between one and three dice with the handgun, depending on how many bullets you spent. The range on the handgun is line of sight, and this means that you can attack anyone that you have line of sight to. Range on the knife is one. It's assumed that when the range is numeric, it is assumed when you have a numerical range that you must have line of sight in addition to meeting this maximum range requirement. Here we have Claire facing off against a zombie. Now from here to the zombie, she has line of sight, and that's because we can draw a line from the center of her space to the zombie's space. And there's not an easy way of measuring this, but you take any flat surface, you just put it down like this, and provided the line created does not cross any of these walls or closed doors, then the line of sight is not broken. So you've got line of sight. Now, from here, Claire could shoot this zombie through the open door, but could not shoot the zombie if the door was closed. From here, Claire is out of line of sight because the line of sight drawn from here to the zombie would cross this wall. Now, because Claire has line of sight, that means she can shoot the zombie with her pistol because the range is line of sight. The range on the knife is one, however, so range one would be here. This is range one, so she could attack the zombie with the knife, which is ideal because he's a space away. This is known as range zero, and you can attack with the knife and the pistol at range zero. This is not ideal because if you attack an enemy in the same space as you, and your attack misses, then the enemy automatically hits you. So you don't even make a basic attack check, you just take the damage from the enemy's basic attack. So now that we've looked at that, what is a basic attack check, and how do we resolve that? So I've mentioned that a few times. We'll have a look at the anatomy of an enemy card in a minute and how their basic attacks work and how much damage you can expect to take. But first let's resolve one of our attacks. If the zombie is here, then we can spend three bullets on our handgun to throw three dice at the zombie. So we'll take three blue dice and roll them. Well, this is really bad because the dodge symbols count for nothing. The one hit that we have rolled, if we check our handgun card, gives us this symbol here, which is push back. And that means we can take this zombie model and move it to any adjacent space. This includes diagonal, but it cannot move illegally. So, for example, we could not move it here if the door were open, but we could move it out here if the door were open, and we can move it here. If we had rolled two pushback symbols, we could push it back twice. So if I open this door, we could theoretically push it back to here, and then push it out the door as well. If we'd rolled three pushbacks, we could even push it back to here. How we do that, I don't know, but there's nothing in the rules that says it cannot move out of line of sight if it's all part of the same pushback roll. I expect this might be fact later though. Now, if we'd rolled this symbol, we would have done one damage, in which case we would reference our enemy card. Here we have a zombie stat card. All of the enemy cards are more or less the same but with different stats and different special abilities. Along the top here, we have the zombie's hit points, its movement value, and its threat level. In here, we have some special rules or texts. And then down here, we have enemy attacks. This here is the basic attack. And on this side, we have a special attack, which the zombie will perform if a tension card comes up that allows it. So that's when we draw from this tension deck later on. Some of these cards say enemies will perform special attacks. But if this card doesn't come up, then you can ignore this. The zombie will always do its basic attack by default. So remember when we talked about basic attacks earlier? If, for example, you attacked a zombie here in your space and you completely missed, i.e. you fired with your pistol and rolled all dodge symbols, that would be a miss. And then you would resolve this basic attack, but you would not have a chance to dodge it, you would just take one damage. So how do we dodge an attack? Well, remember how when we move out of a space, the enemy gets an attack of opportunity or a attack against us. That means that we must try and dodge their attack. 
We'll reference our character's dodge statistic here. So Claire has a dodge of two, which means she'll take two blue dice and roll them. When you're dodging a standard enemy base, you're looking for any of the dodge results. The dodge results go up sequentially in quality like this. So this is the worst dodge result, a level two and a level three. And this is used to resolve dodges of increasing difficulty. So to dodge away from one standard enemy base like this, you just need any of these three symbols to be successful. However, if there were two zombies in that space and we were dodging out of it, rather than resolving two separate dodge rolls, we would just be required to get a level two success. And if we got the level one, we would be failing. If there were three zombies in that space, we would have to get the level three dodge and the other two would count as failures. It's also worth noting that if our friend the liquor was here, this would count as three standard bases because he counts as two. We would need the level three result. This also means that if you're evading out of a space with a liquor in it, you always need the level two result to evade. If we are moving away from the liquor here, Claire rolls the two dice as per her evade statistic. If she failed, however, for example, rolling like this, we would reference the enemy attack, and then we would take the damage indicated under the damage symbol here. So for a liquor, that's one. If we do take a damage, we just tick down our damage meter here until we get to the end. And if it falls off the end, then we are knocked unconscious and we'll probably die. I'll teach you more about being unconscious and resuscitated in a minute in the advanced rules section. So if we had rolled this damage roll and we'd reference the card, we would see that the zombies have one hit point, in which case they would take one damage and be removed from the board. If it were a liquor, however, they have three wounds. So we've just done one damage, leaving the liquor with two wounds left. We'll take one of our wound tokens here and put it on the liquor to indicate that they've taken one wound. And that pretty much covers it for attacking. There are other weapons that are better, i.e. they allow you to throw more dice for one shot. Spending one ammunition will give you more than one die. They also have better results on the stats, and some of them use these better red dice as well. So keep your eyes out for those better weapons, because you'll quickly discover that the pistol is not very good. I'm not going to talk quickly about the action open and closed doors, because it's extremely simple, but there's an important element of it that comes into effect during attacks and later on in the reaction phase as well. When you are next to a door, you can take the action to open the door, which flips the tile to its open side. You can then move through it. Of course, if there's a zombie there, then you're going to have to make your basic attack check to move past them. And uh, you can always uh, close the door as well. But again, if you move through to here and close this door, that zombie's going to attack you as well. Aside from the fact that zombies and any monster cannot move through a closed door, thus protecting you from them, if a door is open, then two tiles that are joined by an open door are linked. They are known as linked tiles. And this comes into effect because some actions, and such as attacking, or elements that take place in the reaction phase, will affect all linked tiles. So by closing doors behind you, you reduce the actions taken by enemies in tiles linked to the one that you're on. This will make more sense in just a minute. But we've only got three actions left, and they're incredibly simple, so we'll cover them very quickly before we move into the reaction phase, which is where the enemies are going to do most of their stuff. Before we completely leave attacking behind, remember how I spoke about linked tiles? Well, this will become more pertinent when we get to the reaction phase, but first, whenever you make an attack, any enemy not hit by the attack, so that could be your target if you miss, or all other enemies, even if you hit your target, will make a free move towards you. So let's have a look. Now in this situation here with Claire, I've opened this door. Claire has no line of sight to this zombie, so she shoots at that zombie, and she spends three bullets with her handgun in order to do it. Now in this case, she's got two pushback results, which don't really help her, because she can only move this zombie into one of these two spaces. But she has hit it, so at least she hasn't missed. However, she hasn't hit this zombie here, who will now get a free move through the open door. Now Claire decides she's going to shoot again at this zombie, but this time she's only going to use two bullets because she's running out. Now here she's missed entirely. And that means that not only is this zombie going to move towards her, 
by the quickest route possible. As the uh, Claire player, we can choose whether it's this space or this space. Probably want it to be this space, I guess. But this one's going to move into our space because even though we're targeting her, we have missed completely. So you want to be careful. Attacks make noise. And zombies are attracted by that noise. Even the knife makes noise. And I guess that's the sound of the scuffle and the groans of the zombies as we stab them. The only time zombies wouldn't move towards us due to attacking is if one of them's already engaged with our friend. For example, if Claire was shooting at this zombie and missed, this one would move into her space, but this one would ignore her because it's too busy eating Leon. So the next action we've got is search. Search is extremely easy. If you're on a space with an item symbol, you can search by drawing the top item of that deck and putting it into your inventory. Note that you have a maximum inventory size of eight, so you cannot carry items over eight, with the exception of herbs. If Claire decides to search this icon here, she'll remove the icon from the game, and then she'll go into item deck A and draw the top item of the deck. She's lucky she's found some handgun ammo. She'll put this in her inventory and she can use it to reload her pistol later. She might also have found herbs. Herbs are noted with this symbol here, and if you get multiple herbs, you can stack them in your inventory and they'll only count as one item. Speaking of items, the next action we can talk about is use item. When you use an item, you take an item in your inventory and then you do what it says on the card. The final action is trade. If you want to trade with a character, you must be in the same space as them or an adjacent space. Then you can take any number of items from your inventory and give them to the other character and they can do likewise. Note that when you trade guns, you have to give over the appropriate ammo dial. And you should also consider what your partner can use. Don't give them a shotgun or a grenade launcher if they can't use it. So now that we've been through all the actions, let's talk about the reaction phase. So I really like the reaction phase because it's like a quick and easy way to take enemy actions. It's preemptible, but it's also presenting additional things you have to think about as you take your actions and move around on your turn as well. And so the way the reaction phase works is that every enemy on your tile or on a linked tile will take one action. And remember, we talked about linked tiles before, but a linked tile is any tile connected to your tile by an open door. So now that I've opened this door, these two tiles are linked tiles. It's absolutely because of this linked tile mechanic that you will be encouraged to shut doors behind you. In the reaction phase, enemies have a simple priority, attack or move. If they are in range to attack, they will attack. Now zombies have an attack range of zero, which means they must be in the same space as you in order to attack. Some enemies have an, a range of one, which means they need to be in the same space as you or adjacent. Now in this case, neither of these zombies can attack Claire, so they'll both move towards her. Remember, this zombie only activates because this door is open, making this tile a linked tile. If we did have a zombie here in the same space as Claire, then this one would still move, but instead of moving, this one would activate an attack, in which case you would just resolve a basic attack like we've already looked at. Claire would roll two dice to see if she could dodge, otherwise she'd take a damage. Now, it's worth noting that if you do suffer a zombie attack, and you fail to dodge, and you take a damage as a result, Whenever you take damage from an enemy attack, if they are at range 0, regardless of what they are, you get one free pushback. So you can push back that model to an adjacent space. This is only if you take damage, though. If the attack misses, then you do not get to push back. If you remember in the video game when the zombie would lunge on you and you'd sort of like grapple with them and push them off, that's what this represents. And this is at any time. So any basic attacks the zombie performs uh, in the action phase, as a result of you shooting or moving through their space, you will also get to push back. So, for example, if you shoot and then you miss, because you've missed, you take a damage, and then you can do a pushback. The reaction phase also forces you to think about working together as a team, because if there are two of you in the same room, then there's going to be a reaction phase for the characters in this room 
then the zombies in this room essentially get twice as many actions. For example, if Claire takes a turn, then the zombies are going to react in the reaction phase. They're gonna, this one's going to attack her, this one's going to move towards her. Then it's Leon's turn, and at the end of Leon's turn, these zombies are going to retake a reaction phase again, and because they're both in the same place as Claire, they'll just both attack Claire, even though it's Leon's reaction phase. The final phase of the player phase is the tension phase. And in the tension phase, you just draw a card from the top of this deck and resolve it. Now I've gotten all clear, so I can ignore it. Some of these cards are not nearly so nice, but they won't always be in effect. And when you draw one of these cards, you just resolve the text on the card, and then you carry on with the next player's turn. This poison symbol down here means that if you have become poisoned, you would take a damage if you drew this card. And that's it for the fundamentals of the game. The rest of this is classed as advanced rules by the book, but you'll need these to progress beyond scenario 1A of the campaign anyway, so now we're going to go into them. But none of these advanced rules actually change any of the fundamentals of the action phase, reaction phase, or tension phase. The key thing to remember is these out-of-sequence actions. So that is that when you attack any enemies not hit by the attack on a tile or linked tile move towards you. Note that this does not involve attacking. The exception is if they're at range zero of another player model. If you attack an enemy at range zero of you and you miss, you take the damage of their basic attack and you can perform a pushback. If you take an action at range zero of an enemy that is not attack, you must make an evade roll, which is part of a basic attack. Whenever an enemy attacks, you will perform an evade roll unless you failed an attack against them. In this case, if you successfully evade, you carry on with the action as normal. And if you fail, the action is cancelled, you take a damage, and then you can perform a pushback. I find those little out-of-sequence, nuanced elements really tricky to remember, but there is a shorthand on the back of the book, so you can always use that if you find yourself forgetting. So I think the advanced rule with the biggest impact is tile encounters. Remember when we looked at this scenario 1A here and we saw the rooms are green? In later scenarios, they won't be all green. They'll be classed in four different types. We have here green rooms, yellow rooms, amber rooms, and red rooms. And these escalate in difficulty depending on what type they are. And the way this works is that when you enter one of these rooms for the very first time, that is the very first player model to walk through the door onto the tile, the minute they walk onto the tile, they must roll the encounter die. Note that this is the minute they enter the room, i.e. walk onto the tile. Each scenario will have a number of encountered tables based on the level of difficulty of tiles in the scenario itself. And when you enter that tile, you roll on this table to find out what the deal is. And it could be really good, or it could be really bad. In this case, if it were a yellow tile, we would spawn two zombies. Let's imagine this is our yellow room here, and Claire's just entered it. When you spawn two zombies on a tile, you start with the closest spawn point and then go to the second spawn point, trying to divvy them up as evenly as possible. In more dangerous rooms, it might specify at the closest spawn point, in which case you would put all of the enemies on the closest spawn point. The next advanced rule which is introduced is the tension deck or running out of time. And in scenarios 1A and 2A, when the tension deck is exhausted, you simply shuffle the discard and reset it. From scenario 3A onwards, if the tension deck is exhausted, this represents the city being overrun with zombies, with the infected, the, the T-virus, the G-virus, and you lose the game. So you run out of time, you lose the game. And the only way to buy more time is using ink ribbons and typewriters. So we'll talk about those in just a minute. Now, we've pretty much covered doors, but there are some advanced rules for doors that might come in later. Now, here we've got a closed door, and here we have a locked door. Now, in order to access this door, you'll need the blue key card, and without it, you cannot go through. If a player with the blue key card item opens this door, 
the card is removed and the door is accessible to anyone, even without the item, from now on. These count as any other kind of wall. They block line of sight. You can't move through them. You have to move around them. Walls. We've also got these stairs. Stairs allow you to traverse between areas. So you'll find them usually on different levels of a map that allow you to move between two different levels. And it's just a move action to move to the next stairs. Enemies cannot go through stairs. You cannot draw a line of sight through stairs either. We've got here an item box. If you remember item boxes from the video games, they allow you to store items. You can store items in an item box provided you are adjacent to it or in the same space as it. You cannot store items in an item box if you don't have line of sight to it because you'd be trying to reach through a wall. But if you want to store any items in there, you just take them out of your inventory and you put them in the item box by putting the card underneath it like this. If another character comes by later on, they can take the item out of the item box. And as far as I know, that's all they're useful for. There's no limit to the number of items that can be in the item box. They also count as a large base. So if there are characters in there, then this base is full. There's no room for a police zombie. We should probably also talk about typewriters and ink ribbons. Ink ribbons are items that you can find in the item deck. And when you find a typewriter in the game, you can go into the space of the typewriter and use your ink ribbon. This action is like a use item action and it consumes both the typewriter and the ink ribbon. It's worth noting that ink ribbons that are found are a play. You don't keep the ink ribbon card. Instead, you replace the ink ribbon with this symbol here. And the reason for this is because nobody actually controls the ink ribbon. The entire group can use it no matter who is at the typewriter. When you use the ink ribbon, you take your discard pile of tension cards and shuffle them back into your deck of tension cards. If you'll remember, because the tension cards running out ends the game, this is useful for buying yourself more time if you need it. And you probably will need it. Last thing to look at are these corpses. A corpse is possibly a zombie. If you have any familiarity with the video game, you'll remember these corpses getting up all the time and doing things, which they shouldn't be. If you end an action in a space with a corpse, i.e. if you're moving through that space, you will have ended a movement action there. If you stop in the space and use an item, you'll have ended an action there. If you start shooting at a zombie in the room with you, every time you shoot, you're ending an action there. Every time you complete one action in a space with a corpse, you must roll the encounter die. Safe. If you ever roll the umbrella symbol, then the corpse will turn into a zombie then you remove the corpse because it's a zombie. You might remember this poison symbol here that I showed you in the components thing. If you ever get poisoned, you flip that to its poison side. You would take poison damage when you flip one of those tension cards with a poison symbol on it. Remember how sometimes when you enter a tile with an encounter and you have to roll on a table, some of these tables also cause poison to trigger, but mostly it's the tension cards. When poison triggers, you take a wound. So you want to get unpoisoned as quickly as possible by finding items in the item deck that allow you to become unpoisoned. Or antidotes that cure the poison. The last thing I want to talk about in this section of the video is resuscitation. Because if you're playing in a campaign mode or even in a scenario mode, you can resuscitate your friends. Now, if you're playing by yourself, you can't resuscitate yourself. But if you're playing in a co-op game and you are knocked unconscious, which means your health tracker has moved beyond danger... Then you lay your model down like this and you can be resuscitated. You can only be resuscitated using a first aid spray. So if you have a first aid spray, you can move into the space with your unconscious friend and then you can discard the first aid spray to put them back to caution and they'll get up and they're ready to go. Now, if you don't have a first aid spray, you cannot resuscitate them. So if both characters don't have a first aid spray, and you know there are none in the item decks because you set them up earlier and you know how many are in there and you know whether or not you've used them, i.e. there's no hope of you finding a first aid spray in this scenario, then you've lost and you have to start over. The win condition is always outlined in the scenario. For example, in 1A, both characters have to get through this door. Pretty simple. The lose condition is always the same. One character is killed. It's worth noting that from scenario 3A onwards, an advanced variant is introduced where if this deck is completely exhausted, 
then the characters also lose because they've run out of time. So with that, I'm pretty much ready to cover bosses. Boss fights are very straightforward, so it shouldn't really take very long to go over it. But if you'd like to see how a boss fight happens, stick with us. So here I've set up the boss fight from scenario 5A, the fight against the G-Mutant. I've given our heroes some more equipment, and I've put out the cards for the G-Mutant as well. Now, there's a few things to note. Once you enter the tile with the boss on it, you cannot leave. You will kill the boss or die trying. It's possible for one hero to enter the room and start the boss fight before the other character arrives. They can still enter the room, they just cannot leave it again. So when you're in the room with the boss, it pretty much functions the same way as before, with your character taking four actions. Those are probably going to be a move and attack at this point. Uh, but you might use items or like uh, first aid sprays or ammunition to reload. And then there will be the reaction phase, which you will skip because the boss does not react. If there's another character still wandering around in the level somewhere, this may have pertinence, especially if you didn't close the door behind you. But the boss does not do any reacting. It is possible for zombies, if you've left the door open, to follow you into the boss room. So if you've got another character running to catch up, you do want to close that door behind you. But uh, the boss never reacts. So the boss does nothing during the reaction step. Then there's the tension phase. And if you're on the tile with the boss, instead of drawing a card from the tension deck, you will not. Instead, you'll draw a behavior card for the boss. So the boss has two cards here. Let's look at them. The boss has a card here. And this tells you some special rules about the boss that come into effect. It also gives you their movement and hit points. So you can take that boss style we looked at earlier and set it to the hit points for this boss. And then you'll note their movement and their special rules. The boss has a behavior deck like this, which is what's drawn instead of attention cards in the boss fight. So just give that a shuffle and then you're good to go. Once you've completed your four actions, you'll draw one of these cards from the behavior deck and carry out the instructions. These instructions might be something very specific. For example, this one says small spawn G Imago. And these are the little bugs that are specific to the G mutant that he spits out. So you just take a little Imago token and put them on each of the characters. If you remember, that's what we were looking at on the other side of the wound tokens that look like this. You just throw them down on your character because they might come into effect later. This one shows a movement and an attack. So if you draw this card as part of the behavior deck, the first thing that's going to happen is that they're going to, the boss will move up to their movement stat, which is one for the G-Mutant. So they're going to take one step towards the active character, which in this case is Leon. Then they're going to perform this attack. Now this attack is range one, and the boss is currently in range two of Leon, so they cannot attack, so they'll just take another step towards Leon. Had they been in range for the attack like this, then the Leon will make a evade check against this result or take two damage. Leon's evade is two, so they roll two dice looking for a level two result. They've got nothing good, so Leon takes two damage. Boop, boop. And now that we've resolved the behavior card, it's Claire's turn to go. She'll do four actions, then we'll skip reaction because there's no monsters around other than the boss, and we'll go straight to the behavior cards. And that's pretty much all there is to the boss fight. The nuance comes from the behavior cards, learning what's on them. If you exhaust the deck, you'll shuffle it and reset it. That's, uh, that's noteworthy. You can't push the boss around, so you've got to sort of move around. The boss has some special symbols that indicate they attack all enemies at a specific range. So you want to try to keep some distance between your characters so you're not hit by AoE attacks. You know, you want to try and keep the boss moving backwards and forwards between the active characters, allowing them to get some distance as you unload your ammunition and give your friends a chance to reload. And once you've run out of ammo, you'll probably just wind up trying to stab it to death. If the boss has a choice of characters, they'll always prioritize the active character. All the special rules are on the cards here, and I'm not going to go through them all because, you know, I'll let you discover that on your own and as you uncover these boss fights for yourself. But uh, any special rules are detailed here and on the cards in the behavior deck as well. The only thing that's worth noting other than that, if someone's knocked unconscious, I, because their tracker is dropped off of their chart here, you can resurrect them with a first aid spray. But even if you don't have any first aid sprays left, unlike in the main body of the game, characters knocked unconscious on a boss tile are not going to end the game. So... 
it's uh, if Leon can win this, despite the fact that Claire's been knocked out, then it's assumed that he drags her to safety and she recovers. But that's only really relevant if you're playing in the campaign mode. So remember that slightly different lose condition there if you're doing a boss fight for the campaign mode. And so that's it for bosses. I'll now just do a quick rundown of what happens in the campaign mode after you've finished a, a scenario. So here we've got an example of Leon's player board after he's just completed a scenario in the campaign. And the first thing you do when you complete a scenario in the campaign is you refill your handgun ammo to 15. So you always start with maximum handgun. Then you can replenish any guns that you have that don't contain the universal symbol on them like this, so in this case Leon's shotgun, by three, up to a maximum of max ammo. So in this case we'll get two more shotgun shells. Then you can reload using any ammo you have, but Leon doesn't have any ammo to reload with, and he's at maximum capacity anyway. Then if you have any healing items like this green herb, you can heal with them. And I fully recommend that you do, because you're going to discard them if you don't. So green herbs give us one level of healing, so we'll go back up one. If Leon were poisoned, he would heal his poison without having to take any action to do so. Poison is automatically healed between scenarios. And then he basically discards anything that's um, not a gun. So any ammunition, any healing items, any scenario-based items are all discarded. And then we count up the number of characters participating in the game, for example, two. And we check how many first aid sprays there are in our collective inventories. If the total number of first aid sprays is fewer than the number of players participating in the mission, you get one free first aid spray. So for example, if Claire had one, then we would get one for Leon. And if Claire had zero, then we would get one and have to decide who to give it to. If they both had one, then we would get zero. But if we were smart, we would have used it to heal earlier, knowing that we would replenish one later. Finally, you have two continues. So if you fail a scenario, you can try again. If you fail again, you can restart one more time. But the third failure, you're out. And that means your campaign ends and you must start over from the beginning. You can also spend one of your continues during this campaign stage step here to replenish all of your ammunition and your health back up to fine. But then you cannot use that continue later if you fail a scenario. Also, during this campaign step, you can freely swap items between characters, bearing in mind that you need to use them up now because any consumables and scenario items are going to be discarded. And that's it for Resident Evil 2. So I hope you found this video really helpful and it's given you some insight into how the game works. I hope it's got you excited to try the game, but if you want to find out more or see how it works in action, I'll be joined by Michael and Ollie tomorrow and we'll play through Scenario 5A and see how we get on. So I hope you'll come back and join us for that. Maybe subscribe to the channel so you don't miss it. And if you want to jump to anything you've seen in this video, my usual sections will be included below. Thanks very much for watching.